is aware of its primary people, and its intellect becomes the passion of its person, or its passion of its body. It may even become mine, or it may use its conscious company and its conscious intent as a magnet for the sympathy of others, as a means of revelation. At phase 16 will be discovered the desire to accept every possible responsibility, but now responsibility is your mind. And this renunciation becomes an independent power, just burdening to be a person of our intellect. Here are born those women who are most touching in their beauty. Helen is of the phase, and she comes before the mind's eye, elaborating a delicate personal discipline, as though she would make her whole life an image of a unified and perfect while seeing an image of softness and of pride, she draws her picture in the same blood as the same one. Yet she will not wonder among her true identity as a hard work that personal discipline, no matter what it may seem according to other discipline. But if she fail in her own discipline, she will not deceive herself, and for all the languor of her movements and her indifference to the acts of others, her mind is never at peace. She will wander much alone, as though she consciously meditated her masterpiece that shall be at the full moon, yet unseen by human eye. And when she returns to her house, she will look upon her household with timid eyes, as though she knew that all powers of self-protection had been taken away, and that of her once violent primary tincture, nothing remained but a strange, irresponsible innocence. Her early life has perhaps been perilous because of that nobility, that excess of antithetical energies, which may have so constrained the fading primary that, instead of its becoming the expression of those energies, it is but a vague beating of the wings, or their folding up into a melancholy stillness. The greater the peril, the nearer she has The greater the peril, the nearer has she approached to the final union of primary and antithetical, where she will desire nothing, and already, perhaps, through weakness of desire, she understands nothing, yet seems to understand everything, already serves nothing, while alone seeming of service. Is it not because she desires so little and gives so little that men will die and murder in her service? One thinks of the eternal idol of Rodin, that kneeling man with hands clasped behind his back. The greater the peril, the nearer has she approached to the final union of primary and antithetical, where she will desire nothing, and already, perhaps, through weakness of desire, she understands nothing, yet seems to understand everything. Already serves nothing, while alone seeming of service. Is it not because she desires so little and gives so little that men will die and murder in her service? One thinks of the eternal idol of Rodin, that kneeling man with hands clasped behind his back in humble adoration, kissing a young girl a little below the breast, while she gazes down without comprehending under her half closed eyelids. Perhaps. Could we see her a little later, with flushed cheeks casting her money upon some gaming table, we would wonder that action and form could so belie each other, not understanding that the fool's mask is her chosen motley, nor her terror before death and stillness. One thinks, too, of the women of Burne Jones, but not of Botticelli's women, who have too much curiosity, nor Rossetti's women, who have too much passion, and... As we see before the mind's eye those pure faces gathered about the sleep of Arthur or crowded upon the golden stair, we wonder if they too would not have filled us with surprise or dismay because of some craze, some passion for mere excitement, or slavery to a drug. 